The name Browning evokes a certain reaction in most people when you say it, and that is this kind of mid-range, 525, 725, Citori, um, guns that are sold in the mass market. Here in Belgium, handmade guns are made by craftsmen to a standard that is unparalleled. Lionel, our guide, is going to show us around the factory and show us around each of these workstations where these guns are made and run through all of the processes and give us a little bit of a, an insight into where these guns are um, made to a, a standard and ethos that is very, very peculiar to Browning Handmade. Lionel, um, thank you for having us. Myself and John are very much looking forward to seeing the factory. Um, take us away. Welcome, and I hope you will enjoy. Let's go. Thank you. <laughs> Before we start the tour, John and I thought we would show you some of the exquisite models available here from the factory in Belgium. Take a look. So John, you, you're the expert, you show me. Some of these I haven't seen before, <laughs> right? so I might be a bit rusty on these models. Alright, okay, so this is getting the excuses in early for getting stuff wrong, go on. Yeah, D5G <laughs> side plate, I mean this is a, a one we've done, you know, quite a few of, quite yeah, a few yeah. pairs and whatnot, but um, this one is one that I haven't really seen a lot of because all the ones we've had mm -hmm. have been fixed mm -hmm. choke. Right. And these now got uh, in Vector DS chokes in. Right, okay. So this is your, your high performance. The DS is the one with the copper ring. You've got yeah. it. But it's high performance steel shot, sure, sure. which is, is what you're needing at the minute. Mm -hmm. But I mean, everything that we've seen here, yeah, just the scroll work on it's just amazing. I mean, even the checkering on the trigger. All hand cut. All hand cut, and all like the detail. See, just that detail of it. Yeah. Colour case hardening on the inside of the trigger guard. Three piece four end. Yeah. So that's, you know, as he slides forward. Yeah. Lovely. And then, you know, these are all, all 12s, but when you just see the mechanism of the four end sliding yeah. forward. It's something special, isn't it? They just are really, really nice. Yeah. And on a, on a B25, like this model here, mm -hmm. D5G box lock, everywhere's engraved, everywhere sure. has something on. That's what you want, though. You need that attention to detail, because, like you say, this is something you're going to be with for a lifetime or two lifetimes and being able to appreciate that is something special right i've just noticed just the inside of this latch here as well the color case hardening still in there too so it's just another little teeny detail yeah like we've seen before inside the trigger guard yeah. this model um this isn't really a model i've seen a lot of but, oh, d4g right we sell more d5s right probably um but obviously game scene with pheasants on oh that's a lovely little thing that's a game scene. That's a game scene and all. Lovely kind of... Look, look at the wood on this. Ah, oh, it's boring. I mean, what, that's been a bad one really, hasn't no, it? No, no. That's all right, isn't it? So this is a Diana. All right, okay. It's just a total, total different style. And then that shading does bring the, bring the game birds it does, out, doesn't yeah. it? And all hand hammered as well, I'm guessing. All of that every one of those little pits to give you the black, effectively. This is something that, I, I don't know what it is. It, I've never seen this before. Um, ah, Africa Special, I think it is? Double, double rifle. Ooh. Some weight in that. 375. Yeah. When we're talking about the strength of the action before, yeah. if you can have a double rifle on the same action as a oh. 20 gauge or a 12 oh. gauge, no wonder there's some strength. I yeah. mean, if you look at the, look at the engraving. Yeah, Wildebeest. Lion. Three lions, in fact. What have we got on that side? Elephants, I think, huh? Rhinos. Oh, rhinos, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, haven't got, I haven't got any glasses on. <clears throat> elephants. There the, the elephants are. Yeah. <laughs> leopard. Leopard. On, leopard on the bottom, yeah. What does that say? Uh, I mean, it's pretty heavy, isn't it? It is, yeah. It obviously is built to uh, withstand a degree of recoil, and I think that would help with a 375. <laughs> but uh, as you say, the action walls on Brownings are thin, deceptively so but all of the strength is in that lockup and in that the way that they're constructed to transmit that recoil. You know, there's a reason that they're still making this action after 100 years and that they can have everything from a 12 to a 410 up to something like a 375. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm not going to get a lot of use in the UK, this, but... Uh... No, no. <laughs> we don't have many... Uh... Not a fox in gun, is it? <clears throat> so this is something, something different, and this is a, a, a B-15. Right. So this is a, a range that Brown has brought out a few years ago now. Um, so all the ones previously we've looked at as B25s and the yep. B15, um, as Lionel was saying before, it's slightly more machine made. Yep. 
and back in the day, yes, chokes, mm. um, but it's all hand finished and, and all the parts are all handmade in Belgium, put together. Um, Beautiful heel plate on there. I mean, engraving, you know, everything in there. Yeah. And this is as a, you know, we were looking before, the yep. dummy, three piece, four inch. Exactly. So when you take this off, it comes a piece. Sure. But it has that look. Yeah, yeah, it's still got the rosettes. Yeah. Lovely. And again, the woodwork finished to the same standard, still the same checker in, which we've seen. It turns out it's a doddle to do. Uh, <laughs> Lovely. Now, on with the tour, starting with barrels. That board is not the most sexy, but it, it, it shows and explains exactly the different step of operation we do on, on the barrel. So, on the bottom, you see the forge tubes. Uh, it's a really good quality steel uh, with a lot of carbon in it. And then we will drill inside the tubes from the two uh, extremity because it wouldn't be possible to drill all the way yeah it's too long basically you would you would change your direction then once the two um, drill are done inside mm -hmm. we, we make sure it's perfectly straight and we can work on the outside of the barrel then from the fourth step you can see the bottom barrel and the top barrel mm -hmm. then the assembly of the two tubes and on the top you see how we assemble the, um, the ribs yeah yeah and in the barrel there, it, it's one piece all the way through all its stages, and it's not fused together. The chamber and the barrel itself. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So we are using the chopalen. So you have the old, the block yeah. mm -hmm. being a part of the tube. On the on the modern caliber or with the steel shut, because we need some added thickness on certain zone. Okay. In fact, the fact that we have the mono block allow us to slide in the tube, keeping the most, um, the thicker thickness around the chamber. Yeah. Compared to two blocks yeah. being welded together. Uh, also, there are some preference to some customers. Some prefer to have a monoblock, some other prefer to have a chapalem. To be honest, I'm doing that for almost 20 years now. I'm not trying to convince anyone. <laughs> yeah. If they prefer one or the other, we propose both. Mm. Uh, then we're going to show you how we do properly the job. The workshop here is where we assemble all the barrels together. Uh, there is a funny engine behind you. In fact, it's the system we use to assemble the tubes together. It's an induction uh, machine made by us. Uh, and in fact, the objective is because we selected the best steel ever to make our barrels, we don't want to change the state of the, um, of the steel. So we found it a little bit silly to put the tube in the oven for 20 minutes mm, yeah. because that could change the kind of uh, carbon and, and the structure of the steel. Yes. <clears throat> so with the induction system, we can bring enough heat to the zone we want mm. to assemble within three minutes mm. instead of 20. Uh, and I guess we're going to show you a little bit later how sure. it works. Uh, and basically, the two tubes are um, assembled together, and we use silver for the tubes mm. and tin for the, the, ribs. the ribs. Because the temperature are different, mm -hmm. um, the fusion temperature of the tin being lower than the, the silver, mm. if one rib is damaged, for example, we can disassemble the ribs without taking the risk to change any convergency or to move the tubes of the, of the barracks. Mm. He's making all the, the string work around the rib. So oh. the first operation consists to slack a coast of uh, tin on the two zone that will be assembled together. So that's the reason why you can see some shiny tin um, zone on the barrel. Uh -huh. In fact, because there's a, a coast of tin on the barrel, on the rib, then they will assemble the two parts they will use a different metallic string to make sure the, the, the rib won't slide and move when he will eat it up. And then he will put the barrel on the flame 
to eat the barrel and to add some more tin to make sure the welding is perfectly done. Oh. He will continue to do all the, um, the tension work and mm. then he will call us later you can take the picture of the flame. Excellent. Okay. Okay. Brilliant. So here we, uh, we are showing you how we do the assembly of the tubes by induction. Mm -hmm. So the first operation was to make sure the two barrels were in line and respect the convergence that mm -hmm. uh, all the browning shotgun needs to have. So that's the, the reason why you can see those kind of clamps which are quite precise uh, and then there are some paste and we will do the injection assembly using uh, tin, a uh, silver, sorry. Silver. Yeah. So, so, so what's the, the white material, like the white the sort of liquid on there? Uh, la, la pâte, so... So it's... Uh, in fact, it's a kind of acid that okay. will clean up the surfaces to make sure the silver is directly Bond. in contact, it's yeah. not damaged or anything by any uh, residue of oil or anything like that. So. Yeah, yeah. And, and how hot is this going to get? So it's turn around 800 degrees. Oh. Then when, once the metal will be hot enough, he will add the, the baguette to so the, the rod he has in his hand. Uh -huh. And which is um, silver, mm. and the heat by capillarity will um, yeah draw it into the. Yes. So that's heating that pretty quick, isn't it? It is, yeah. In fact, the, the the heat change the consistency of the material, so we don't want to change the, the consistency so we want to make it as quick as possible because an hardening for example what it is is to eat up a part and then to cool it uh, fast right okay so, so here we want to to make sure the carbon is not um, changing in the steel yeah so we heat it up quite uh, quickly and then we can put the part in the oven not to to eat it up but just to make sure cool it's it slowly cooling too fast yeah Then would you check if it's hot enough now? Or? <laughs> oh, I imagine it's quite a thick uh, block of steel, no? So it's extremely fast. So the, the plugs on the end of the barrel, they're keeping the barrels together? For well, the convergence. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> wow. As I said, the oven is just to, to, to cool the material, not too yeah. fast. It's just that. You so control that yes. coming down. Yeah. Yeah. To avoid any hardening, basically. Mm -hmm. Because we want the barrel to stay stuff. Mm -hmm. Because when you shoot the barrel, it has an undulation, in fact. Yeah. So we don't want something too hard. Mm. So, as we explained earlier, uh, the, the children are well with uh, silver. Now he put all the side ribs and the top rib, which were uh, adjusted with the black lamping uh -huh. before, just to make sure that they are, they are uh, fitting perfectly the tubes. Why we do that is to, not because we want to waste time or to sound more clever than the others, but the tin has a maximum capillarity buffer between two parts. Mm. So if the fitting is not perfect, in fact, you will have micro bubbles mm. in the welding and that will make mark or the ribs will pop out. Yeah. It's just for that. So we need to do a has to be perfect. Yeah. So there's already a post of a team on the zone that needs to be assembled, but it's not enough. So now it will eat up the, the barrels uh, to have a kind of um, a standard temperature. And when it will be uh, hot enough, it will use the um, added tin, mm. he will add some tin on the rib and with capillarity again, the heat will suck the tin between the, the ribs and the barrels. And then uh, what he use is called colophane and that makes the, the tin more liquid. So it's to make sure uh, the, the tin is going in every yeah. zone to make sure 
there's a, a perfect contact. Yeah. Nice. So, so what's that? It's called colophane. Uh, it's a kind of bees uh, wax, if you like. Okay. Uh, it's um, it's a product that will make sure the tin is perfectly liquid. So it helps the sort of liquidity, right? Wow, I've never never seen anything like that. Yeah. It's it's not a quick process, this is it? Yeah, you know, no. it takes a it takes a while. Yeah, yeah. It's because he's, he's checking every centimeter because um, first he needs to, of course, we want uh, the rib to stay in the barrel. That's yeah. obvious. Yeah, yeah. But the two other thing is, um, it needs to be clean and done only one time because when we're gonna polish the, the parts, it's extremely difficult to see the difference between tin and steel. Okay. You have to know then with the system of blacking we do, with the old system of coals, etc., that doesn't black the tin. Mm -hmm. So if he, if he is not doing a perfectly clean work, at the very final stage, we can see some uh, silver line. Ah, right, because the blue one doesn't take, yeah. That would be the first problem. The second problem is also if his assembly is not perfect, uh, it will make some micro bubbles. And when we do the coast of blacking, in fact, it's uh, um, some uh, coast of acid. And if the acid goes into those micro bubbles, mm -hmm. When they stay uh, to get their oxidation, you can have some leaks and some trace. That will make marks in the barrel as well. So it must be perfectly done. Because again, we decided to use the old system of blacking yeah. uh, on the B25. We could use a chemical bath as we do on more modern guns, yeah. but we want to keep it as it was in the past because it's how it should be done, in our opinion, but also it's between seven and nine coats of blacking instead of one. To so get that lovely is, color. The yeah. color is unique, yeah. and also it's thicker than one chemical uh, coast. Yeah. So when he's, he's running like a, a file there, is he, or a knife, is he just cutting the, the excess out, is he? He's removing the excess to be able to have a look to see if the okay. line is perfect in his opinion. Yeah. Uh, we will, do the, we will take the picture later, but it's for the, um, the polishing of the internal zone of the barrel. So, um, in fact, we, we try to make the most straight of tubes. We try to keep the state of the um, steel the best as, as it can be. Uh, and, of course, we need to do the polishing of the inside of the tube. So we don't want to be too violent with our work. Mm. So instead of using stones uh, to polish inside, some, some customer and some, uh, some competitor use stone, uh, we prefer to use a carrot of lead. So what's the, the idea behind that? In fact, we have some carrots of lead um, with the exact dimension of the bore. Okay. Uh, so we, we, we melt those here inside the, the workshop. And in fact, because the carrot is around 12 centimeters, we don't want to force something too hard in the tubes. The lead has the right consistency. So uh -huh. it's solid enough to push all the emery dust, with the polishing dust. Mm, so it's like a paste that's going on the, on the lead. E exactly, yeah. 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 Uh, it's strong enough to push it around the, the, um, in contact to the barrel, but it's not hard and it won't damage the yes. geometry inside the tubes. Uh, and also, there are some segments in the tube, so you have the chamber, a first cone, then the tube, a second cone, mm -hmm. and then the choke zone. Yep. And it's made by, by uh, tools, so you have sharp edges yes. after yeah. the machinery. Using lead that would allow us to round it a mm. little bit those edge, and when you shoot lead, for example, to have something smoother, mm. will keep all your pellet more round, yeah. and that will give a better shoot. So it's less fouling on the internal barrel surface. Yeah, yes. better pattern. Exactly. So the guy does it by hand. So he will put the rod on the machine, mm. and then he will, he will enter the rod into the barrels, and you will hear and see later how he does it, and also the sound is important because you can hear 
where the carrot is and in which uh, zone of the barrel the carrot is. Okay. Then he disassembled the, um, the barrel from the clamp and with the light he checked the internal uh, state. It's really important to, um, to do it by eyes because we, as you know we are on the FN facility so we have all the laser, all the laboratory that we want but the best system to see any defect in a barrel is the human eyes. We, we, we can spot something with our eye that a machine in the laboratory can't. Yeah. Uh, so he just use a corner of a windows mm. and he will make a really thin light of a, a line of light in yes. the barrel. And by turning it, you will see any defect, any bump, any marks only by eyes. It's mm. the best system ever. Bonjour. Bonjour. This is Philippe. And Philippe is going to show us the operation, which is really the first proper assembly of a B25. That operation is extremely important because that will bring the strength and the expectation of life of the, of the gun. Mm. If the fitting is perfect, it means you won't have any moves during the shoot, no move, no use, and you can keep the gun almost forever. So uh, it will show us the assembly of the barrel, iron farm and receiver. Uh, to do that operation, uh, it will use the black sam uh, lamping system. So uh, it will add a small cost of carbon on the different zone it needs to check. Um, and what it's going to um, adjust will be that zone, yep. then the recoil surface also. Uh, you will see the print of the contact in the receiver yep. and also the noise will be extremely important because that rings a little bit like a bell. So if it's perfectly in contact, the sounds will be sharp and metallic. Mm. If it's not good, in fact, that will bounce Dull. and the sounds is a little bit weird. That's experience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's... But brownings always have that noise. When you close a browning, you can tell it's a browning with your eyes closed. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and the last thing you're going to check, on that stage, the fitting is extremely tight. Mm. Why? It's because if it's too easy, in fact, you wouldn't feel any nod, any problem of the fitting. Mm. If it's hard, it needs to be a constant force mm. to open and to close, and he will allow, he will be allowed to, to fine tune the, the hand fitting. Then we're gonna ease the opening, etc. Mm. Mm. That stage must be really tough. Now he will place an inch pin to start to the, um, the fitting. Mm. Um, but it's the early stage. How long will this roughly roughly take fitting an action to, to the barrels? Depuis du début à la fin, Philippe, tu vas mettre combien de temps pour faire un ajustage complet? Complet, ouais, tout, préparation, tout, bascule, préparation, tout ça. On fait quatorze heures. So it needs two days. Two days to fit the one action yeah. to barrels and the foreign. Yeah. Wow. Well, Because it's the B25 and we don't want to make an industrial gun, we could do something different. Yeah. It's what we do and propose with the 525 and 725. But here it's a little bit the masterpiece. So we want to keep all the operation as they were in the past. Yeah. The objective not being to use machine. Yeah. We want to have a workshop still making gun the most similar as 100 years ago. Yeah. So we use some some machine where it adds a real value to the work. For example, for the top rib, we prefer to use a mean machine to make sure the top rib is perfect perfect straight. straight. Uh, but for all the other operation, we want the craftsmen to do their art as it was done in the past. Yeah. And if we want to propose something else, we won't call it a B25. That's the reason why Browning has so many different platforms. The B25 is the masterpiece. It's a handmade one. Yes. Yeah.
So we can see the contact. Yeah. So that's the beginning. It's not uh, it's not finished yet, but you can start the contact on the top and on the bottom. In the middle, it's normal. There's no contact because the extractor needs to be a little bit underneath the surface because. For example, if some um, residue of um, powder goes on the extractor, that could lift it up a little bit, and that would that could bounce on the receiver. Yeah. So, in fact, what we want is to have a contact. <laughs> so that one's finished now. You can just. Yes. <laughs> Let's move on. And là, en dessous, ben voilà, on a aussi le recul qui doit. Ah, il est pas bon, hein. il doit vraiment descendre, il doit vraiment... So that's the recoil zone, uh, that one is not done yet, and in fact the contact will go down, and in fact it's where the barrels is in contact on the receiver. Yeah. So the locking system on the Browning is the hinge pin, which is extremely wide, just under the chamber. Mm -hmm. You have a really wide bolt, which is that part. Okay. Which is com which has the complete uh, width of the barrel oh. passing through. You can see the, the bolt here, uh, and the last locking zone is the bolt. So you have a, a complete hard and solid locking in line just under the chamber. Yep. Uh, that brings a little bit of height of the receiver, but in our opinion, is the best locking system. Uh, because it's extremely solid. Mm. It's known for longevity, isn't it? Yeah, you know, the B25 action. Yeah. yeah. You've got that full length hinge pin, the bite at the bottom of the monoblock. It's classic, it's been around since, yeah. Yeah. well, and, yeah. and you've got <laughs> 100 years, right? Yeah. And no rock back, you know, they open up, fully open yeah. up. You know, ah, yeah, no, the game, you never get that open. Yeah, no. yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, I touched the blacking. Uh, <laughs> the no, he has to do it again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but look at what <laughs> you use different file to to fight only on the shiny zone. Yes. To make sure the barrel is going a little bit down, which is a really difficult operation because in fact, when it's good, it's good. We don't have any room, so it needs to be done slowly. It will remove a little bit of material, then recheck, and it will do many many times unless unless it's perfect. Uh, and Philip uh, re-explained that. On that day, stage, it must be extremely strong and tough because also after that operation, we will send the gun to the proof house. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in the proof house, we do a superior proofing, which is quite a lot of pressure, and that will put all the parts in place also. So we leave a small buffer everywhere to make sure itself the gun will take his, his room in the receiver, mm -hmm. and then we will clean it up to make sure it's more friendly to use for the different customer. And talking about that, it's funny because it's all also a question of trend. 20 years ago, the customer were asking us to have something extremely hard to open, to have a buffer to, to, to extend where? the life yeah. right in. Yeah. And these days, probably our customers are a little bit more delicate. <laughs> and they want something much more easy, easy to, to open, which is not uh, a problem for us, yeah. but it's a chain of trend. Recent, recent change. Yeah. Oh. I suppose they want to just go onto the game field and just immediately make the gun open, yeah. get the cartridges in, ready to shoot. Yeah, probably. And the Browning stays tight for so long. Yeah, you know, it could be not 10, a big deal. 15, yeah. And the customer is always right, so there's yeah. <laughs> no problem about it. Yeah. We want and it's a decision to make most of the operation by hand. Yes. Yeah. We like to say that the B25 is made with sweat and blood. Uh, his sweat, your blood. <laughs> uh, because we want to keep it really the, as a symbol of the modern gun making. Uh, but modern doesn't mean machine, in our opinion. The mechanic is modern, but the technique we, we use is, uh, is the, the, the most historic. close to the historic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a choice. Uh, and as I said again, we have many, many other offer to the customer if it's not what he's looking for. The B15, the 525, the SW25. So we try to have different offer for different needs. But the, the B25, it really is the sort of forefather of all over and under shotguns which have ever been mass produced. It, it's, it's the one everybody's copied and it's yeah, yeah. a testament that B25 is still being made mm -hmm. in the same, same way and same design. Yeah. Yeah.
And we don't think there's a lot of stuff to improve, actually. It's, it's working, it's reliable, it's solid. Uh, and there's, because of its mechanic, there's a certain weight repartition, a balance oh. that the, our customer likes. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's a whole image and feeling, and we don't want to touch any ounces of uh, yeah, yeah. 25. Yeah. Sounds like you when you're asleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, as you know, on the B25, we have different grades. We have the B, C, D, and uh, side plate grades. Here it's an example of um, side plate model. So after the old operation we just saw, the worker will start to do all the design and the shape of the external. Um, of the B25, so as you can see, it's out of the machine for the moment, uh, but we want to refile every millimeter square by hand to, to make something really artisanal. So the first operation will consist to make sure there's absolutely no gap, uh, nothing uh, wrong on the, on the receiver or on the two other parts, and then uh, he, will tar he will start to make the, the final shape. To do those operations, uh, he uses chiseling and files. So this is what, what he is doing for the moment. He, he draws by hand the sharp edge uh, of the head of the receiver, and by chiseling, he will he will uh, remove the material to be able to do the final shape. So how? So this this round shape here. How is that put in from the the square? By hand. Yeah, so as you can see, there's many, many different type of file, and uh, from so, this to that, it's done by hand. So he's taking that round edge by hand? Yeah, so on the inch pin, the first operation will, will be to, to smash it up to make sure there's no gap, yeah. and he will refile to, to have the, you can still see a little bit the, um, the different zone of the file on it. It's an enormous amount of work. Yeah, huge amount. It's a handmade gun. There's no joke about that. It's a choice. It's a handmade B25. So we are not using the machine, as I said, when it's not a, an added value to the gun. Uh, it's the original painting. It's not a copy, it's not a poster. So does he have a, a form, a, like a guide for the curve, or is it just by eye? It's because he's used to do it. Uh, it's the same for the, <laughs> for the sharp edge, he does it, in fact, when the, the, the GMB collection worker, it's a little bit like the Formula One team of running, so uh, they all would like to be a part of the team. Right. There's a question, of course, of experience, but there's also a question of age. So, as you can see, the, the pyramid of age in the workshop is quite large. It's the strength of the company. We have some young lads, we have some senior lads. To make sure all the transmission of uh, knowledge is uh, assured for the next generation. Uh, but it's a mix between learning, training, and talent. Mm, yeah. It's not enough to, to really want to be able to do it. There's a je ne sais quoi that mm. makes you a good craftsman or not. I mean, I think if we were trying to get both round edges to match, our actions would be different sizes all the way through. <laughs> and imagine when you are a right-handed guy, yeah. it's probably easy in one way on your vice, but when the gun is on the other side... Yeah, it's, it's more difficult. Good yeah. point, that, yeah. I've never, I've never actually looked at them, though. No, hey, no. <laughs> somebody never... So the metal that he's working on now, that is in like a soft state and then it's to get hardened? It's not that soft. To be no, that's soft. Yeah. No, no, soft no, 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 no. Uh, it's a uh, it's a high uh, level of carbon steel, and in fact, at the very end of the um, the assembly, yes, we will do a color case hardening. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, we remove the color with acid because, in our opinion, because we embellish the gun with so nice engraving. That would be a shame to leave the color on the receiver. Yeah. We had some color case model in the past, tradition, etc. Yeah. But it was with really some small uh, scrolls on it. 
Now it's more high grade games, so we get rid of the color. Why we do use a color case hardening? It's because it will make a kind of uh, armor around the steel that will prevent against corrosion and marks, but the receiver keeps his elasticity in fact. Okay. If the receiver were to hard, that could break. So we want to protect the metal work, mm -hmm. but we want to keep the steel as it is in size. He's, he's, he's tapping, you know, pretty hard there, yeah, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Well, he has brain a chisel through steel. <laughs> so every refining will be slightly different depending which worker. So it's unique it to that yeah. artisan, effectively, who's made Sometimes it. Sometimes the engraver moans a little bit about that because they have to adapt a little bit their design to the receiver. Now, honestly, you need to be an expert to see the difference. Mm. But, but but that's what you want, though, isn't it? It's the difference. You know, if it was a, a laser engraving, yeah, you know, you, you want to look can and have that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. whether yeah. identical. Yeah. This isn't. Just isn't it? You're paying for a, a service. You're paying for the handmade. Yeah. And. That's the pair, so uh, you need to do something perfectly the same on both sides, but on two games, uh, which adds some more difficulty to the work. Uh, and to give you an idea, that job uh, will take a week to make a, to the refining of a pair. Mm. So that's an example after the refining, before the polishing. So what he's doing for the moment, basically, it's to work on the sharp edge here. Mm. So if I take the, the original receiver, you can see all the material that has been removed by hand, by <laughs> chisels. That's quite a lot. It is, huh? This here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You imagine all the difficulty to have something perfectly parallel. And it's getting the getting the curved line right, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, I hadn't quite realised the amount of material yeah. in here. That's funny. And you imagine he, he has no chance to be wrong on that because, no. uh, of course, we cannot just uh, weld some material to fix an issue. So uh -uh. it must be right first time. And the shape around this little scallop here and uh, yeah, like the detonation. It's a design that would be extremely difficult to do by machine, in fact. Yeah, yeah. So Even here, just this little that radius there at the back of the um, at the back of the rib, which is here just raw. Amazing. To do those jobs, we have a lot of handmade tools also. So that's, for example, right. the submachine piston <laughs> that they transform, and that will uh, that tool is to to push the material to to ease some shape. And every worker has his personal tools yeah. made to his hand for a specific job. Sometimes it's just to use once with one hit, but it, it has a perfect shape for the perfect zone. Uh, so after refiling, we will go to the stocking. One yep. moment. Sorry, I just I want to see this. So. Beautiful. Uh, so that that is the very very last original uh, HP pistol. Ah. Um, we were used to sell quite a few, um, mostly in the US. Yeah. Uh, so it's called the Renaissance model. Uh, it's com fully engraved. Yeah. He will. Uh, bring a, f a finished one. Oh wow. Um, so it's really engraved that those one are on point 40 but the, the, the right. biggest quantity we made were, were 9 mil. That's not really an English product anymore. No 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 <laughs> but I just I saw it from over there I recognized yeah. it and uh, I saw the the amount of engraving work that had gone into it I thought it was just beautiful so. It is yeah. It worth is. a look. Uh, he was waiting on the slide a moment ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can really see all the really light uh, cut of chisels. So that's the very last one. We hope then we will be able to engrave the next generation. Uh, but for the moment, uh, it's quite sad for us oh. because uh, it's on hold for a few years. Oh.
Ça fait... Chamber is empty. Si. D'ailleurs. Merci. Oh, wow. The engraving's absolutely incredible, isn't it? Yeah. Even the woodwork. Yeah. That furniture. So it's uh, is... Turkish walnut. Mm. And we have a silver version. We have a gold plated 24 karat version. And we have two other models also, but those ones are probably the most uh, famous. It's called the Renaissance. Still the original design with the uh, uh, interrupter for the magazine? Uh, or did you take that out on the, on the more recent? You mean the small paddy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's the original system since 1935. Yeah. And when Dana said it's a point 40, as I told you. Still it. unmatched in terms of the ergonomics of that grip. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's perfect. Lovely. Thank you. <coughs> it's for sales, if you like. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, we can't have those. <coughs> It's engraving as well. Yeah, it's beautiful, isn't it? So even this this work here, would this be cut in by hand, or is this? No, it's finished by hand. There's a base uh, from machine because it's a military gun at the yeah. very yeah. beginning. But then by hand, they make sure all the lines are perfectly straight. through <laughs> everything <laughs> in here. Uh, How did they get you out of here? Pallets, pallets <laughs> of wood. Do you have um, to like sh just put the alarm on and just kick them out? Or <clears throat> So I've had these, you know, I'm just here, so I thought, well, I'm going to try and find some wood. Mm. I haven't actually got any guns for these yet, assigned, right. but when you find something, you want to yeah, yeah, sure, sure. just reserve it and pick it. And I just think these two blanks, uh, or this pair of blanks, I just think they're going to be they're going to be really, really nice. Yeah, yeah, I very think, much so. Um, when you get these ovaled out, and then this was another pair, and I think um, when you see, ah, oh, he's got the sponge, magic sponge. <laughs> oh, lovely contrast. Yeah, and that's just water, but when you see sure, them sure. all up, I like them with a good bit of yeah. black. and That the nice honey and black. There's a nice bit of fiddle back through here, um, straight in the heading. <clears throat> Again, as we keep saying, straight where it matters, pretty where it doesn't, nice. <clears throat> so I think these are going to be these are going to be something special, and when you look at them on both sides, yeah, no matter which way you can lie them, yeah, I like them when they're like this because they're nice and straight, and they already look like a stock. Yeah, they already have that shape round, so they look like they're meant to be a stock. Yeah. So hopefully, these will be on a pair of guns. The Pretty John soon. Henry How to Pick a Stock <laughs> Masterclass. <laughs> I just know what I, what I only pick them because I like them. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, well, you've got and, nothing else to base it on, have you? <laughs> so it's not what uh, I understand, obviously, it's not everybody's, you know, everything got the same taste, but generally, if. Oh, this is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, I always say it when you see them like in this flat one dimensional, yeah, yeah, yeah. when they're ovaled out and you know, teardrops are cut in or side plates are getting cut in. You can see how that detail is going to come out of it, especially once it's in that 3D shape and it's been checkered and everything. Yeah. yeah. I just need to figure out which, which grades I'm going to put them on. Mm. And when Leonel can get them made and shipped. Five, six years, probably. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we've seen that quality takes time, so... I mean, when we're, we can have a route through and say what... Something a little bit different here. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Would this be your choice? Um, for something like... I'm not saying that, you know, it's really a question of taste, but you have some long vein on yours. It looks a little bit more like a turtle skin or something. Uh, it's a, it's okay. really quite a unique piece of wood, huh? 
uh, you know, it's really a question of taste. But uh, nature is beautiful, and when you see this kind of piece of wood, yeah, and these are available. <laughs> I don't think there's any accident that these made it onto the table in front of John, shall we say? <laughs> it's not the colour I was expecting when you see that. No, you don't think that's going to turn at all out like it just did. I've never seen something like that. Sometimes you have a little bit of not like it. It actually runs a little bit straighter there than mm -hmm. what you expect that to, yeah. to, to see. They're not awful, are they? No. <laughs> I still think I prefer them. <clears throat> but it's just different tastes, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. I bet. Do you have a specialist, like buyers, that go out trying to find stuff, or do the companies come to you? Or? It's the, that, you know, it's a small world, mm. so, and we are one of the, the big companies. Uh -huh. So for us, like, from other, like for other big companies, it's easy because they come to us. Sure. Uh, and the specialists are the stocker, mm. basically. So we prefer the guy who will uh, make have the to work with the wood. To check the wood is uh, suitable for our mechanics. Makes sense. Uh, and then, like that, we are fully confident that uh, that could be perfect on the gun of the customer. Mm. And also, Browning has a quite large warranty on the woods. Mm. Of course, there's sometimes some discussion, but we, we like to be more than correct in terms of warranty, so we need to make sure the wood is uh, the best as it can be. Yeah. Um, so we will probably propose a certain type of wood on a certain type of shotgun and caliber yeah. because we know, for example, uh, that caliber is a little bit more nasty, so mm. we will avoid such a kind of uh, right. fiber mm -hmm. in grain. <clears throat> on some other more smooth, we can probably use something a little bit more fragile. Yeah. But fragile is probably not the right terms because if the fitting is well done, mm. if the contact are right, normally it should never break. The risk comes from often after the first or the second season, because after the first season, after X hundred shots, the, the contact can change a little yeah. bit. So we always advise the customer to go back to John, mm. like that John can check if there's always some uh, gaps where it should be a gap and if the screw is tight enough. Yeah. Plus you don't know in terms of the customer's environment where they're keeping their guns, whether it's too hot, too cold, too wet, a lot of different things can change the, the wood. Yeah, <clears throat> that's the reason why we like to work with a limited uh, number of dealers. Oh. Uh, in fact, we have a certain point of sales in Europe. Why? Because we have a personal relation between the dealer and us. We know each other very well for a few oh. years. We have our mobile number and yeah. so on. And also, it's important because if they know us, they know the way we product again. Oh. And they can explain to the customer why it's like that, yeah. uh, how it's made, and how to take care of the products. Yeah. If the relation is only through emails and to, uh, of course. to, to, to boxes. And, and I think one, one thing that I like is, just what Leonel was saying there, if you pick a blank out, you want the advice from the guys that know, to say, yeah. mm, don't really want this one, sure. what about this instead? And, and that just gives you a bit of confidence right. in, in what you're going to get, yeah. sure. a little bit of a help. Yeah. And how are the stock blanks dried? Uh, naturally. Uh, naturally, yeah. yeah. yeah we don't uh, use oven block or anything like that. Yeah, which is a safer, safer way of drying yeah. blanks. Yeah. yeah, yeah. because if you try to do it fast, you will have uh, something dry around, but the half will be wet. Yeah. Or it will crack, or it will move. Warp. Yeah. So th this is the only way. But that goes back to the sort of P25 way that yeah. there might be a bit quicker cheaper way to do something. That's not what it's the do. most expensive way to do it, let yeah, it dry yeah. naturally, but you're getting the best best blank out of it. Yeah. You know, it's the pinnacle of our brand, so we we think our best ambassador are, are our customers. Of course it is, yeah. So it's that as a customer, huh? yeah. let's be frank, it's not a cheap game, so we, we think the customer deserves the best, so we try seriously to make the, the best we can do. So we get the best material, we try to get the best worker, and we spend the time needed to make the best as possible all the different operations. Okay, so on that stage, we will show you the, the fitting of the receiver, the metallic part to the, to the Turkish walnut, uh -huh. uh, the shaping. Then we have another stage a little bit further here, and Xavier will show us the check ring. So, 
of course, to be able to show you the three main steps, mm -hmm. we need three different persons making three different operations. Okay. So, we use only uh, Turkish walnuts coming from roots. Uh, why from those countries, Turkey and all the Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan and so on? It's a question of uh, ground, in fact. Mm. So we need all trees with a, with a really hard and stony ground mm. to make sure the roots are forcing their way and that will make all the, the nice figures you can find on the roots. The first operation will consist to take the measurements of the customer. So there's a rule that says that if you take the measurement from the eye to the bone, etc., you can give an average uh, measurement, but we always ask to our good customer, like we want to bring the customer to a shutting ground mm -hmm. with a, a professional um, coach, mm -hmm. because he will see the way the customer is uh, aiming, in fact. Mm -hmm. Because is he lying on the stock? Is mm -hmm. he only lift, lifting? There's different way to shoot, mm -hmm. good or not as good. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, that has an impact on the, the proper fitting of the of stock. When the measurements are done, uh, we will start to take all the measurements to make sure the drop, the cast and the length are perfect and uh, that we keep the, the best zone from the block. Then, uh, to make the fitting, we, as it's a technique quite similar to the black lamping. We will add some uh, pigment, some red pigment on the metal work. And then we will start to enter the receiver into the, um, the wood. And you can see the contacts. So is all of the head work done by hand? We just do one uh, cut mm. to remove like a slot. Uh, the slot, yeah. but all the rest is, uh, is recorded by hand, yes. So, so where should the contact be? Should it be all over the whole action? No, no, no. The most important contact is there, because it's where the, the main screw is uh, pulling the receiver in contact. And in fact, we want to have the, the, the recoil in line in the stock. So we want the contact here, we want contact on the two ramp there, and we want a really small gap on the side. Because if there's some contact on the side, that could lift a little bit the recoil and uh, break your stock on some other okay. area. So it must be really forced uh, all the recoil in line in the stock. Once the, um, the fitting is perfectly done, it will start the shaping. So now we're drawing the, um, the tears and we use chisels and a uh, big blade. That's the, the big tool you can see on this bench. Ah, draw knife. Fracture les cajons comme un coup de plane pour la. And often more the wood is nice, more complicated it is to work. Yeah. Because there's different um, uh, difference of density. Some some zone will be soft, some zone will be hard. Yeah, that's really difficult. So then the knife doesn't cut in too deep. Yeah. Yeah. No room for error. And again, we want to do it by hand. Yeah, yeah. Because when a customer buys a B25, he has he's, it's what he's buying, in fact the crowd from guys who have been trained for years and doing all the work as an art. It's just taking a tiny amount of all the time, yeah, yeah. real, real thin slithers. You would expect to be reasonably careful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going for it there though. Oh, aye. no messing. Yeah. So, so you see the lines on the underside of the stock, the pen marks, as he put them in so he knows where to stop to yeah. with a knife and then he'll finish it off with a, with a curl. file. Yes. Yeah. And obviously the cast line for... And of course if they're making a pair, well, they need to get the matching perfect and you can't make an error on one, you know, you need to keep the pair planks together. Exactly, yeah. 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 Bonjour. So, as you see, it's uh, it's already shaped. So you have the conciliate bed plate, screws are done, pistol zone, 
he drove the, um, the tears and now now is uh, inlaying the the side plate so in a, in around these areas here okay. yes okay so he draw the external shape and then with the um, the red pigment he is doing again the, the best fitting as possible yeah of course, when you're putting the side plates in, you can't have any gaps and you can't make a mistake. You can't get any filler and try and no. fill it in. It no. has to be... Yeah, we have a, a finished one. Oh, yeah. Here's yeah. one I've made it's earlier. Quite different. I can't <laughs> find a new home, so... Uh, wow. So you can see here, the fitting is absolutely perfect. Uh, the engraving is quite impressive. So, so what engraving is this? Uh, it's called the special flower. Oh, okay. I've never actually... It can be yours, Jen. Can it? <laughs> <laughs> that one is, uh, is a masterpiece. The 20, 28? It's 20. Yeah. Uh, I was thinking about you for that one. I'm sure you can find him a nice home. Is it just if not, I will have to send it to the American customer, but I think that deserves to be in the UK. <laughs> and is this a single or a pair? A single. It's a single. It's a dream to anything with this. Yeah. I'm not getting the hard sell or anything here, are we? <clears throat> that is very pretty, though. Look at the detail yeah. on the top just behind the rib. Yeah, I love that little gold inlet in there. And when, when did this start to get manufactured or made? Or? Oh, we don't made a lot of those models. Huh? Uh, I think we made maybe three or four units maximum. And the special flower was designed like 15 years ago maximum. But when did the production start for, oh, for someone uh, like this? That game. Uh, we probably start like four years, four or five years ago. Oh, that quick. Yeah. That yeah. trigger guard's lovely. Like. But we always focus on, on customer guns. Yeah. yours and on the other guns. Very pretty. So when those ones are for the stock or for show, of course, they are on the side and they work on them when they have time between two customer guns. That's the reason why the stock guns are even longer to produce than yours. Is... When you see all the detail of the engraving. Yeah, I yeah. know, it's very pretty. The gold inlay is, is, it's not too blingy, it's quite subtle, it's the, the, the depths, nice. it's a really 3D deep scroll. It's just, it's just border work around. Yeah, yeah. around yeah no, I, just, it's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I like the little Very touches, nice. the diamond sort of design. Well, even that, that little bordering around there on the trigger guard and that sort of motif, uh, like almost like a freeze in the... So we'll be available pot. on the Bywell uh, website. <laughs> <laughs> oh, easy, Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's generous gift, that. You'll have to mind if you smash it off me, not. Tu peux montrer un week, super. So now, Xavier, you will show us um, the technique you use to, to fit the side plates. So as you know, it, the B25 is not a side lock, uh, but we have some side plated version in order to, to extend the, the engraving zone. And also that brings a, a sleepiness uh, of the receiver but it's, uh, it's an aesthetic uh, specification. So really now we've made an error cutting that side plate <laughs> in. <laughs> the stock's been made, everything's shaped out. Yeah. Yeah. P45 is of you. <laughs> That's a very specialist chisel. Yeah. You use the same in the UK because when I was working for Churchill, uh, we were using those as well. The, the really specific tool we've got, and we'll show that to you a little bit later, is the check ring tools. Because mm. in the UK, you use the American version, so they are called the gun tools. Uh, and we have a FN system, small looking like forks than a cutter like yours. I'm an old hand, a bit of check ring like. <laughs> <laughs> You've never seen something like that? Wow! Huh? No. They have different types. That's uh, very different. So, Lionel, what, what is this for? That's a check ring tool. 
that's how our chicken comes, yeah. So it's made in-house here at FN. Uh, we will show you how it works, but we call that the, um, the forks. Uh, and that, that allow us to do different pattern of check ring. Yeah. So this for bordering, I guess? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It's the, the perfect angle to be able to Scoot lift up all the, the small cuts. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So. Ok, shall we? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. En fait, on va revenir à chaque fois pour refaire des images sur euh, toi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so, once the, um, the stocking is done, uh, we will do the, the um, polishing. So, first, we will put some water on the stock to, to raise up all the drain. Mm. We cut them until it's perfectly smooth. And then we will uh, use uh, a grain filler, which is uh, an internal recipe, something we, we, we do ourselves in the workshop. Mm -hmm. And it's a mix of clays and uh, an hardening. And that will, that will fill up all the small dots uh, from the grain. Tu veux montrer un gars dans première pièce? So Xavier is just bringing us a three pieces for arm. Uh, so it's a, it's a specialty we do on the B25. So instead of having a, a single piece for arm, mm. we have uh, two plates of walnut fitted to the barrels. You see how precise and mm. difficult the job is because it will be the room for all the ejection system yeah, and yeah. On the browning shotgun it's, it's a NAMA system. Yeah, the wood the metal fit along here is just absolutely seamless. There's yeah. no yeah. You see? Justifiably proud of that. Yeah. <laughs> and all then, hand filed I'm guessing all hand cut. The same in, in finish. We are three pieces. And in finish yeah. You see, the difficulty is to be able to slide it, mm -hmm. uh, and it needs to be tight, but not too much. Yeah. Uh, and we don't want to see any gaps. Yeah. So, if there's a small correction that needs to be done, it's going to be on the first months, because from the workshop, it's perfect when we ship you the gun. But maybe during the, the, the in, in the box in the truck uh, from here to your place, you will get some uh, humidity or cold yeah. that can slightly move the, um, the the fitting, and then we just need to, to to scratch a little bit to make it more mm. easy. But don't forget the guns are new when mm. they, they leave the factory. So so why why is the fore end have this three piece or the slight and fore end? Why does it not come off like a, oh. a five two five or a on the B25, John and Browning found that it was a good way to make sure you don't drop your forearm, you don't lose your forearm. Yeah, so on on the pair, you don't, you don't swap the two forearms. Yeah. Uh, so instead of having three parts, you have only, only two. two. And also, it's a complication, like an automatic watch instead yes. of a battery watch. Uh, it's, it's to show the, the craft of our, work, uh, yeah. our worker as well. You see the three screws mm. are passing through the ribs. Uh, and to give you an idea, it takes almost the same time to do a complete stock than to do a three pieces for mm. It's uh, It's smaller, but uh, the More intricate. Of, yeah, mm. it's extremely difficult. It's extremely thin. Yeah, yeah. And that needs to be solid and last for the... Lifetime. Yeah. So, as I said, after that, polishing, and then we use a kind of grain filler, so it's a paste like that. We will put the first coat, then we will let it dry, we will remove the excess uh, with, uh, with sand, and then it's a superposition of coats that will fill up all the grains. Mm. And that will arrive to, uh, to finish a little bit uh, like that. Mm. Here's what I did earlier. So that's already the, the, the oil, oil stage. So we use a mix of uh, cooked linseed oil with some other ingredients. And in fact, our objective is not to have a shiny effect, it's to make a kind of armor around the, the wood. Yeah. So it's only oil, 
it's not a varnish and the interest is in fact with a varnish if you make a mark and a nut you have to remove all the varnish and yeah. to, to restart from scratch here if you have a nut we can lift up the, the knock with a hot bar of steel and a little uh, wet cloth and then you only slap a little bit of oil and it's back to the original finish easy to repair yeah, yeah. so the, the it won't be shiny very long it's not what we, we are looking for it's really to do the proper old school oil finish yeah, yeah. And how long does this take the finish from start to finish it can take weeks every block it smells <laughs> <laughs> Oh, smell that. <laughs> every, every wood yeah. will set the oil in a different manner. Yeah, yeah. So it can take weeks. We never know. On the really final stage, even if John is chasing me about a day of <laughs> delivery, we can give an average date because uh, sometimes it's two weeks, sometimes it's a month. We, we don't know. And, and will different parts of the stock depend on take up oil differently and you know you're trying yeah, to get it all yeah. to match in together yeah, yeah. Yeah. sometimes you can have some ghosty zones yeah. uh, that will take uh, longer to have the perfect finish yeah. so do you oil in the checker and then or is the checker in they there are some oil but uh, then they clean it up because mm -hmm. we don't want to have the the oil that will uh, fill up the, the nice cut they made okay. yeah so they if it was not oiled the color would be like that yeah, yeah. so yeah. we need to have some oil inside to make sure the humidity in the water doesn't go inside the woods, but we want to keep all the sharp cut from the check ring. The finish in that is, I mean, I'm guessing this isn't it finished. Not yet. This is like, but the, it looks almost too perfect to be a human made thing, if you know what I mean. Um, it's beautiful. A nice bit of timber as well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. And how long will that hang? Uh, but first, he will decide when he thinks the finish. Okay, so it's based on his eye. Yeah, it's yeah. based on his eye, and then uh, to be comp the longer it dries, the best it is. Mm. So we don't want to deliver the gun straight away after that. If it can stay a couple of weeks in a control uh, humidity yeah. uh, environment, it's the base. It's the best because. Uh, the dangerous moment is the, the wrapping, in fact. Yeah. You use a, a silk paper to, to wrap it. But uh, we, we hope our customer uh, remove the packaging straight away when they receive the, um, the gun to make sure the oil can breathe for the longer as possible. Yeah. So if you want perfection, you have to wait. Of course. <laughs> yeah. So we just asked Lionel what this curious machine does. And it has an extraordinarily uh, specific purpose. Tell us about it. Right, so <laughs> that will help us to write the right bending to the, the back tank of the receiver on the turn to gauge. Mm -hmm. It will give the right angle to make sure the drop further on the stock will be correct. But also the right arch shape yeah. to make sure all the moving parts have enough room and work perfectly inside the receiver. So it's not only the gap, between the top and bottom, it's the curvature yes. and the relationship between the two. Yeah. And that's all that machine does on one gun. Yes. <laughs> and then to make it perfect, you, you have to refile, refile it to yeah. make sure it looks perfect. Yeah. Ex extremely Bit specific tooling. Well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's, a, it's another Xavier. Don't think all our workers are called uh, Xavier, but it's uh, <laughs> It makes it easier because I <laughs> remember everyone's name, right? Um, so, Every uh, model, ah, we have different patterns depending on the model. So for the moment, he's, he's making the check ring on a B15. Uh -huh. It's the same technique than on a B25. So the first operation will consist to use some um, frame with paper. Uh, and then he will take some measurements. And then he will put the... the, the so once he took the, the measurement, he will use the piece of paper to make sure the, 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 the shape will be okay. Ah. And ah. like that, he doesn't have to use a, a dry point mm -hmm. to mark the boots. So he's not using a Sharpie? No. Yeah. Or a pyro. <laughs> I see. Yeah. And then he follows the line. Yeah. That's clever, isn't it? 
So, I said there's a bunch of uh, really specific tools made by our company, and it works like a fork. So it's a soft steel with a certain angle, and in fact, it's cut it in, in diamonds. So the first operation we need to make the, um, the frame, and then in fact, he will make the first cut. And further he goes, he will use the first line as a guide and cut only on the second half of the tube. Yeah. So every few lines will make sure that he is perfectly keeping the same direction. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely difficult operation because the woodwork are, are finished. And in fact, if he is not deep enough, you won't have the, the proper diamond points. If he goes too far, he will chop off the head of the diamond mm -hmm. and he will make some holes in the check ring. Ah, yeah. So he yeah. must be right first time. Mm -hmm. We don't have any buffer of wood to be able to refile to start again. Plus, obviously, all of the bordering, you have to hit every border yeah. perfectly. Yeah. And we saw all the operation made before. You imagine already all the, the cost That's right. of that part. <laughs> so, uh, so what happens if he goes over the border? Uh, he can't. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Then we see how sharp the chisels are. <laughs> if you fix it, you're going to see it. Yeah. Right. You will see that it will be filled by something. So yeah. he can't. He just can't. Yeah. And uh, imagine on a, on a flat a uh, piece of wood that would be already difficult. Here there are lots of radius, it's angular, so they know, so they see, but the most important is the feeling they have in their, their, their hand. So Xavier will show us, in fact, the position of the tool is more or less uh, 30 degrees, because if you are too low, you're gonna slip. If you are too high, you won't be able to cut. So he has to keep a certain angle and... Uh, in relation to the surface of the wood? Yeah. Which must be difficult because obviously the, the checkering tools I'm used to seeing have a curve, so you get a little bit of like kind of leeway in yeah, terms of that angle. Yeah. Whereas this is flat. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. No, he was offering a go. Ah, oh, yeah. Oh, but <laughs> shall I do it? No, but <laughs> we would like jump to have a go on a plate of uh, wood to see how mm. good he is. <laughs> He hasn't really got much fear of going over them lines. No, I mean, you can see he's making that look like an absolute doddle. And it seems to be easy, huh? He's yeah. Yeah. Can you do it? <laughs> I learned a little bit, but maybe I could do a couple of lines, but nothing would be out to death now. On your gun. <laughs> of course, he cannot sleep at all because he would do a double cut mm. and the customer would see it. Yeah. And he will face the same difficulty than the stocker with the difference of consistency zone by zone. Mm. Some, some zone will be soft, some other will be hard. And you imagine with such kind of movement, if he stops, that will make a certain mark. So he needs to anticipate the difference of consistency. I like this special forend tool that he's yeah. got for articulation. It's a tool made to make sure you don't have to disassemble mm. from the... the the forearm, uh, and in fact, we made it a really long time ago. It gives generation to the generation if uh, it stayed the workshop. So he has to keep jumping over every every line to get that angle, yeah, yeah. and the line has to go all the way around as well. Yeah. So, at what point do you actually cut? The forend in half. So that one is a B15. It's a it's a dummy three pieces. Okay. So on on the B15, but we propose it only on certain B25. But that line is only a cut done by the checkering tool. Right. So it's a, a kind of a, yeah. on the real three pieces form, as we just saw mm -hmm. at the stocking. It's uh, cut it from the very beginning, of course. Wow. Okay. And how well, fine how fine do you have to make that cut to obviously because it fits together almost frictionless. How fine is that? It's not the way it's done. We cut it, and then we do the fitting with okay. the file. Okay. But we have three types. We have the the one piece form, the dummy, uh, three pieces, and, and the three pieces. Right. And the difference between a B25 and a B15 basically is 
The B25, all the mechanic is done by hand. That's what we show, we show to you today. Uh, and then it's embellished. The B15 is a, an industrial base. So we removed all the mechanical tolerances on the machine to make it bigger as possible in our tolerance. And we only do the assembly by hand, and then we embellish the gun with the same worker than on the B25. Yeah. But the, the base product use more machine than yeah. the B25. Yeah. I really would like John to have a go, so I will get a piece of wood for you. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this. <laughs> so am I. <clears throat> You never know, it might be quite good, is it? Yeah, oh, definitely. First cut's a doddle. <laughs> you see how good your diamonds are? Right. Is that you fais un peu le teacher? So, dear John, you never complain about the quality of our check room. We would like you to try. <laughs> right, okay. So, um, Xavier. He's got you a nicer bit of wood, look. Yeah, yeah and it looks. So, you see, the bit he's picked for me, it was all, it's all bumpy. Oh, yeah. You, were, yeah. you were destined to fail there, John. Yeah. You cannot fall off so now. There's two options. You can try the plate of wood, or we can take one of your stock. And <laughs> I think I'll try on this. <laughs> so, the fork, as you see, first we do. The master line. So we will do the first line for you. Master Thank line. you. Oh. That's the turn, the pressure okay. on the tools, and you push on the other end. At the, at the start, don't go... No, no, no. Use, use a part as a guide. The, the line I made to, to do new lines. No, no, no. So we are not cutting anything there. We want you to continue. So, so you use a certain quantity of line as a guide in your tool. You need to fill them you yeah, need yeah. to feel the teeth are in, and then you, you push a little bit that way to cut there. Oh, you need to push like a man, John, please. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I'm not even straight. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's pretty <Yeah>. terrible. <laughs> I, I will show you again. So when you have the, the first line, they, they, are, they are done. At the start, go two, two by two, not... So you use two lines and you cut slowly, slowly. And, wh and when you know you are in, you push. You push stronger. Okay? That sounds familiar. It's over. <laughs> two lines, slowly, and then up. We push two lines. Can we edit this bit out? <laughs> you see? Not Sorry. a chance. <laughs> oh, I've got it, man. Got it. Yes, and then you, you push to get it deep. Stick that four and back in. <laughs> How do you know what angle to make the diamond? I have a, a pattern. Ah. And uh, it's by eyes. Too, too many angles rise. Mm -hmm. When it rise and no many it's square. Yeah. It's square, so we have to. I 
think we can probably just leave him here for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> we'll come back when you've finished the entire surface. Do you want to try the, the other lines? Yeah, of course. Yeah, do the diamond. Yeah. So now that we've got the hang of the first way. What do you think of that? Yeah, it's pretty good. Bad, huh? yeah. 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 But that was the easy part, because now you <laughs> really need to cross it. I yeah. I do the first. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Cheating. Because now the guide won't help that much because you will have to pass over the lines. And then that reveals the start of the diamond point. Right, so which way am I going? That way or that way? Where are you at? Mm, I think this way looks deeper. No, I'm not checking out. Mm. Got a bit deep. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that's easy, yeah. It's when getting there, the it's getting the pressure right. Yes, pressure right. You have, uh, you have to feel it with, with the wood. And when you learn, during month and month, you work on plate like that, mm. line, 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 and then you cut, 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 and after, when you you feel it, you go to to the studs. How long? Oh, it, it depends the man, the, mm. the pressure. It should be good, yeah. Yes. How long for you? Uh, for me, it was... It was a different way, but uh, at least three, three, four months practicing. Xavier is the stocker, uh, so he was already working with wood for years. Oh. You understand how the texture and the grain. Yes. Are... Uh, each wood is different. You have to feel. Bravo, Jen. Yeah. You can cut, recut the first to, to sharpen it. it up. Don't be too hard with him, he's a good customer. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It reveals the warps when you. Ah, that's that's very good, Jim. All right. For a person. He's got to get back in the car later, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Look at his head through the door. <laughs> it's good, huh? Yeah, yeah. You can send these guns over and check it if you want. I'll, just, <laughs> I'll, I'll do them in my spare time. That doesn't mean I will give you a rebate, right? <laughs> Just leave me to do this. Yeah, one. yeah, I figured you, you look like you're enjoying yourself. Oh, yeah. But see, there I've gone too deep. Yeah. It's getting the pressure right and mm -hmm. different density of wood. Keep sick. Can I have that? Yes. Oh. <laughs> That's going to be on my desk. I don't know. <laughs> just, just oh, well, I can lie it over and say oh, that. Yeah, that yeah. <laughs> I think, have we got a pen so you can sign yeah. this side? <clears throat> not easy, yeah. Yeah, that, that side's a bit better, like. <laughs> yeah, it is actually. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I will keep that for you and I'll give it you later. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the only thing I won't be able to show you is where we do the color case hardening. Yeah. Because we use uh, cyanide. Right. Yeah. So it's toxic. Yeah. We'll just send some in. <laughs> yeah, we are not allowed to bring it yeah. on. Yeah. And honestly, I don't want Boring. to go there. So, uh, <laughs> Make sure that's last, though. <laughs> <laughs> all the, all the yeah, yeah, we'll it. get all the other footage first. <clears throat> uh, 
Bonjour. Uh, she is known in the entire world now. Uh, Gwenda uh, is working on a Diana. So the first operation consists to make a design on a piece of paper. Of course, we have some really famous model as the Diana. Then uh, she will add some grease on the metal. She will draw the design with a pencil, mm -hmm. then with a half point, and then she will start to use different types of chisels and uh, micro tools like that. Um, that's it really. Uh, mm. It's the Belgian way, so you can see she's standing up and all the body turns around the vines. Mm. Uh, it's different than the Italian technique or the Germanic technique, for example. Uh, and here in the custom shop, we use um, basically all the chiseling, but also we have uh, one pneumatic uh, tool there mm. uh, that will allow us to make some um, fine and detailed and line work, uh, yeah. lines. Yeah. So it's not at all a tool that will allow us to go faster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or make something um, cheaper. Yeah, yeah. It's more because you will be able to work with a pair of binoculars mm -hmm. and to do the, the, the finest details. Lionel, why has the, the action got the hammers in now? Is you know, they partly built up or...? It's because they are not... Uh, you are asking why we keep all the mobile parts in it? Yeah. To make sure we don't lose them. Mm -hmm. uh, if they, they are not a problem at all on that stage of the fabrication. Okay. And because on the Browning B25, all the parts are really fitted to make sure there's no movement, as I explained earlier. In fact, you cannot swap parts. So the fit those each. pair of hammer yeah. are for that receiver only. They need to, to work perfectly, they need to be fitted. I think after I've been successful with the check run, I could probably do this as well. Hi, John, have a gun So we will, we will see Jean-Marie at the pneumatic uh, catalog. Right, yeah. And then we will come back and you will try to make a line. Oh, yeah! Une flat. Oh, you're ready for the tattoo tout de suite? Yeah, yeah. So we will start now then. Oh, yeah! Mm. <laughs> this is probably here's, an extra Here's a hard. piece of steel that she just happened to have ready for you. I'm just going to shot this way, Al. So you're alright. No excuses for the tools. So we would like you to engrave the uh, root grouse uh, with a typical uh, feather in the head. Yeah, right. just, a, just a bit of a, just a bit of a compass, if you could. <laughs> with a, a triangle like that. So, uh, just, uh, like there? Yes, but a little bit lower and more just yes, like that. Say goodbye to your chisel. Anything could have scratched this the way after this. <laughs> Yeah, I'm giving up. <laughs> Just to make sure it should look like that. Ah, yes, yes. <laughs> Can you show me a straight line? I will try. It's it's the bit of swarf that's left. Right. Do, well, I'll have a go. Uh, you, like, you, uh, yeah. She's hitting it a lot harder than you Yeah. Were. So <laughs> you're putting quite a lot of pressure onto the chisel there, yeah? To, oh, yes. Yeah. Go on then. Go on. I'll have a go. Can you, oh, sorry, I haven't got my glasses on. Can you see if the, the point is the right way down? 
So that's a demand on the point. Uh, no, no. Sorry. No, not so high like that. Uh huh. Got any excuses in there, Amy? Seems to move, does it? <laughs> you see when there's the big guy with the beard, and he cannot take it as much. That's, that's quite a big, more of a gouge than. <laughs> well, that that one's mine. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's two approaches here. Let's try again. Hang on. I like how he has to look where the chisel is. Yeah. Nothing, nothing is moving, yeah? Oh yeah, there's a small chip. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm getting, it just goes deeper. How do you keep uh, it? You have to go... To maintain the, the right. Engine, yes. Try again, hang on. Bravo. Ooh, that's yeah. better. So you kind of... I, I think, mean, I've scratched uh, it when I'm coming out, but... I think we should stick to shooting them. I think that's probably the best idea. <laughs> I, I'm sorry I broke your chisel. <laughs> and these really sharp edges, I'll let you sort yeah. of... <laughs> we'll not take the tub. <laughs> no. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, maybe one thing I would, just would like to show you, it's uh, we saw on the other gun some inlet of gold. Ooh. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we will show you how we actually make it. Je peux prendre... Uh, yeah. Just knock them off with the chisel there. Uh, How fast did did you put the line in? Aye. Like, straight along? Yeah. There's me scratching my little bit, and you just went deeper and deeper and deeper. <laughs> Trying to drill a hole in it. Yeah, yeah. And you, you seem to be proper whacking it. Oh, I was giving it some grief, like. Yeah. Um, but, like I said, I think, because I was digging in, I was trying to get it to, like, tunnel out. Right. Obviously, I that think, was... I think our have a go stage should finish now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, a document showing how we made the um, special flower, the one you saw. Oh right yes. There. So you see all the design of gold and how does it work? So it's what you try to do. So first we do a line. When it's only to inlet one wire of gold, first we do a cut and then we will do a cut under the surface. Then we will put the string of gold or other type of material, we will hammer it up to make sure it goes under the surface and then we cut the top. So in fact it's not glued or welded. It's mechanical. Or it's mechanically old under the surface of the steel. That's, that's, four line. that's what mine look like. <laughs> <laughs> when it's to make a shape, so first we do the external shape, then we remove all the material inside. We do a kind of checkering to make an accroche, and then it will be juxtaposition of uh, wires side by side that will make the complete pattern. Oh. So here it was a triplet made for an American customer, and you can see the fizzing with all the different type of, uh, of material used. Look at the detail of the turkey. Wow. And imagine that first she was making the external shape, then removing the material, using different type of, um, of uh, gold, silver, palladium. But you imagine the gem it is at the beginning. So mm. it's only some bits of, uh, of material. And then they refile it and the animal appears. Mm. But they know how it will look yeah. before it actually reveal the, the design. So it's, uh, yeah. it's an extremely difficult game to, to play. Getting the shape of the outline of the animal yeah. to start off with. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy, you know? That's just amazing. Yeah, yeah. But next year, when you are trained, we can start to... Yeah, sure, sure. Mm. So then, when the engraving is done, we will reassemble the metal and the woodwork, and then we will have a final um, uh, control made by Bernard. We will take some, some uh, images of that later. Uh, then we test again, so we go to a chinel to test them with a few ammunition. Mm -hmm. uh, but they've been proofed before this stage though? They will be proofed just after the, the assembly. Yeah, then. so you don't spend the time engraving them. Uh, then when everything is sorted, we do the packaging and my favourite part of the production is the invoicing. <laughs> <laughs> it's my worst bit. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, so Jean-Marie is working on a pair of Renaissance uh, using pneumatic chisels. Um, that technique allows him to work on a pair of binocular and that will uh, allow him to do some really fine presses, cut, because he doesn't have to hit the chisel with a hammer. Uh, and that brings uh, a quality of cut absolutely incredible. So you have the first um, gun of the pair, which is done here. And you see the depths, the detail of the, of the leaves. All the button hit it to make the texture. Mm. And that is 100% made by hand. By, by this one guy or done in multiple? By this one guy. Right. Yeah. So we we had a this, these were Nathan's. I think we had a pair of these. Mm -hmm. and they were delivered uh, the week we went into lockdown. We saw them right. fourteen days later. Really? <laughs> fourteen days we had them. Oh. And how many hours is in that? Like each gun or, or in the pair? Uh, you, you need you need to count only for the engraving. You need to count uh, around. Six, seven hundred uh, it's just, hours. Yeah. Uh, so look, look, look at that. Yeah. The depths. You imagine in the curved line and the gold inlet with the numbering there. You, you, you see the the, the, the angle like, uh, mm. there. So, so does he engrave one gun complete? Yes. And then start the next one. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. In fact, when we are in the rush and we need to speed up a little bit, what we couldn't imagine to do on a game scene, for example, it's one worker would do all the frames on both guns, and another worker would do the animals. When is this? Because when I asked for a pair of guns, you quote me like two year. <laughs> but two years is the reason. It's not only the engraving. <laughs> <laughs> can I have a, can I look? Yeah, of course. And the, the delivery time comes from the fact, and thanks God for that, we are really busy for the moment. We have a, an order book uh, full for a few years. So, um, and also, Jen, we are the specialist to take uh, pairs of side plate high grade guns, which are the most time consuming. Mm -hmm. And uh, because they are high grade, they need to pass through the most skilled uh, workers, so uh, the master, if he has to have five of your pairs, imagine the number of thousands of hours of engraving, mm. so that, that brings a, a late delivery time. Just a different, even forget the engraving, just the, the different shapes in the in the, the trigger guard, yeah. and then the different thicknesses of the material. Everything that's been hand filed. Yeah. Yeah. All the measurement, drop, cast, lengths, uh, he will check if there's any gap. He will check if uh, the checkering pattern is respected, if all the diamond points are perfectly intact. Um, then he will do all the mechanical uh, control about the opening, check if the, all the mechanic is going on the right time. Um, he will make all the aesthetic control, if there's an, any mark inside the barrels, any pitting, if the, the blacking is perfect. And then he will do also the shooting test. Okay. Uh, and once Bernard stamp the, um, the certificate, it means it's uh, reached at minimum 100% the, the burning uh, specification. So the, the shooting test is that just to check the, the barrels converge in the right place and patterns well? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But now, in fact, everything is done when they assemble the tubes. Yeah. So we know it's good. Yeah. yeah. We never had any issue. But if we would have any issue, we could, but we never do, but we could rework a little bit on the choke zone okay. to change a little bit the convergency. Yeah. But, you know, we are doing that again for 100 years. So that's the kind of operation we know. If there's a problem, it will be more linked to <coughs> the natural material. You know, uh, sometimes a piece of wood can crack. Yeah. Um, on, on the barrel here, it says, you know, B25, 20 gauge. Mm -hmm. Is that engraved by hand? Yes. Yes. Those one, yes, but sometimes it's made by roll or by laser on a B15, for yeah. example. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so there's, depending on the grade, it's made differently. And on the left side, there's uh, marking uh, with Browning Arms Company, Morgan, Utah, and Montreal. Oh. It's because the original company, of course, is an American company. Oh. It's Belgian owned now from oh. the late 70s. Uh -huh. But to export a uh, gun to the US, it needs to be written on the barrel that where is the, um, the yeah. company importing the gun. Right. So because we know the, um, the expectation of life of a B-25 is extremely long, we know a B-25 will have maybe one, two or three lives. So we want to make sure you guys can export a gun where you want in the future. Yeah. So there's a reason why we do the, the American marking on the side, yeah. even if it's 100% made in Belgium. It's, I know it's all, it's all engraved now, but when we were looking through before at the plane action, <laughs> and you're seeing this scalloped line put in by hand, yeah. you think, well, even if it was a plane action, yeah. it's still I, impressive that yeah. that's... I, I was, uh, funnily enough, we, we took a good break there, and while we were in the break, we were looking at some of the guns on the wall, and appreciating that all of this scalloping and all of this, these cuts are all hand done, and then engraved, and this cut here is hand done. It's a level of workmanship and a level of skill that goes into this stuff is just you don't appreciate it until you've seen it um and it's definitely a bit of an eye-opener when you think about just all of those lines that they were done by hand with no guide there's not a machine yeah it's it's very very cool but i think once you saw that in really in a workshop and how difficult mm. it is you will notice way more easily the difference with an industrial game yeah yeah because you will think how it's made mm -hmm. and you will see that the, 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 the design for refiling on an Israel gun is done in a certain manner mm. to allow you to use ma uh, machinery. Mm. This wouldn't be possible to be realized by a machine. Sure. It's too sharp, it's rounded, it's too complicated. Yeah, yeah. Even when you see the engraving, even if we use a, a laser mm. or an acid edge or a roll system, it will look similar. Mm but it's like the sparkling wine and the champagne. Yeah. It looks like, but it's not the same. Yeah. yeah. John and I are more like uh, Aldi, Astis Piumanti. <laughs> <laughs> based, based on our engraving skills so far. <laughs> uh, no, it's a, it's a stunning, stunning piece of artwork, oh. I think is the best way to describe it. On the inside of the trailer, I always like where you can see the colour case hardening. It's only an aesthetic because inside it's not engraved, so sure. instead of having a polished uh, finish, we thought that was better looking to keep the color. I think it is. I, I love it that. Is. It's yeah. lovely. Yeah. It's a nice detail. But w the treatment, the color is all over the place, in fact. Yeah, but, but you've just, 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 just keep polished it, it where, where it's not engraved. Mm. It's just a, it's another finish, though, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. It's, well, it, it's something else that's interesting. The, the beauty is in the detail of these guns. You know, if you buy something like this, you are buying just the intricate beauty of it and the intricate detail and all of the workmanship. You know, that, that's something that you're going to keep for years to come. Yeah. Even as you can see, these kind of rosettes that have been hand, I'm assuming these are all hand cut. Of course. Uh, that are just effectively screw heads, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. beautiful. Every single detail, as you said, is uh, they think about that and sometimes they have some proposal to change slightly something. Uh, so on, on the basic models, we want to keep the exact pattern, but on tailor made you know, special project for the customer, there's always a base on paper, oh. but during the process of fabrication, sometimes the worker will come to us, oh. meaning the customer, saying, oh, listen, I have thought about that, don't you think that would look better? 99% mm. of the time, it's the right idea, and that happened. But they, you know, they, they, they spend so many hours with those parts in their hand. Mm. For some projects, it's funny because the customer come back to me saying, oh, you know, what's happened about that gun? Uh, you know, if the customer is happy, where does he live? And they want to know yeah. where the gun went and mm. where is his house. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, spending hundreds of hours on a, on a piece of art, they hope the customer take care of their game yeah, yeah. and they, they, they know how valuable that, uh, that game is for the guy who made it. If the customer has a perfect balance, mm -hmm. zero, zero at the inch pin, we can do it with that tool. Mm -hmm. But most of ours are not completely zero, zero. Mm -hmm. 
they are always a little bit more in the back or in the front, depending on the, the customer wish. To counterbalance that, we can add some weight in the forearm mm -hmm. or in the stock. But the moment where we use the most that tool, it's more for the pairs, in fact. Because and the like balance is the same. Yeah, like uh -huh. I said, the value, and we can know exactly <clears throat> from the border to the iron forearm and the H pin, that will give, you, give us a value, and then we can fine tune the balance between the pair. So it's rather than, ah, uh, yeah, I get it now. So we're here in the, um, in the branding factory, and just it's interesting that there's this, this display of motorbikes in the center, and we're just asking Lionel why these are here. Um, it turns out FN make a vast array of things, historically, over time, ranging from motorbikes that we can see here through to guns, kind of all manner of stuff, right? Yeah, we did uh, cars, we did trucks, we did milking machines, golf clubs, uh, tennis <laughs> rackets, a lot of stuff. Uh, and in fact, those motorbikes are here for the moment because we made um, a new side of the, the group, mm. it will be called Ars Mechanica. And in fact, uh, we want to keep a piece of history of everything we made. Mm. Uh, so those are the emblematic model of motorbike. We, we won some, uh, some really famous race in the past. Um, it's just to show that we, we are extremely accurate and good into, in terms of mechanics. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, we are not in those business anymore mm. because we are really busy with uh, the gun manufacturing. Mm. So we wanted to focus on that. But it's other style of arts that we made in the past. <laughs> so this, this site, how long has this factory site been here? We are here for 130 years. -ish. 130 years? Yeah. Wow. You can tell, I mean, if you, you kind of look around, we've been concentrating on all the different workstations, but if you actually look up, the history of the building is in this ironwork and the, uh, you can see it's, it's an old building. Yeah, you can see the, the, the frame in the back of the workshop mm. is a, is a hand-painted uh, frame. Mm. Uh, we wanted to keep the John M. Browning Collection workshop as an old industrial workshop. Mm -hmm. Some of the parts of the company are more modern, of course, for all the yeah. military side. But here we want something quiet, we want something elegant, we want a pleasant place for the worker to make uh, their work and to make sure the, um, the B25 are made in the best condition. Yeah. Funny, we were just saying this earlier about that. Everything is made within like a 50 yard square of like the gun no travels. Distance, it? Yeah, it travels 10 yards between each station and, and everything is done in this room. Everything is done by hand by these people. Mm -hmm. And you can see that here end to end in your, your finished product. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. John and I hope you've enjoyed this tour with us. If you're interested in owning one of these exquisitely made guns, please give John or one of the team at Biola a call. They will be happy to discuss your needs and help you to acquire a piece of history for you to enjoy for generations. <laughs>